Uh, welcome to the November meeting of the Rock County Conservationists. The Rock County Conservationists, some of you know, it's a private conservation group in Rock County, but we hold public programs once a, once a month. In the warmer months of the year, we usually do outdoor nature programs. We also do programs that involve restoration activities, burning prairies, cutting brush, that sort of thing to try to help restore natural landscapes. Once a year, we hold a native plant sale, and the money from that sale is used to help fund environmental education activities. We fund school groups to attend Wealthy Environmental Center and the Leopold Nature Center up in the Madison area. So we're real proud of those activities that the fundraising we do does go towards environmental education. Our program today is being presented by Larry and Emily Shaneman. They are retired Janesville educators, been retired nine, ten years yes. now. Yes. They have been involved uh, in a lot in the study of wolves all over North America. They've been up to Isle Royale, Yellowstone National Park, the Northwest Territories up in Canada and, Canada, and had the chance to work with uh, some of the big names in wolf biology, particularly David Meech is a real well-known wolf biologist and we've had a chance to work with him. <coughs> I'm going to turn it over to you. You'll be able to talk more about the wolves than I can. Okay. <laughs> it was really um, enjoyable preparing today for today's program with this PowerPoint and putting together all the different things that we've collected. Even in the last year, we keep getting new perspectives and new understanding about wolves. And the whole story of wolves for us began when um, I was teaching a unit on wolves in my middle school, teaching at Marshall Middle School, and I needed to learn about it myself. So we have, we learned to, to track wolves and were involved in Timber Wolf Alliance, that is um, the organization that sponsors me as a speaker. Uh, we also learned to track wolves with the DNR. They uh, had workshops and we we learned how to recognize tracks of different carnivores, and we're still involved in that volunteer tracking program. Um, what happens in our state is they have citizens help monitor or survey the amount of wolves in different areas where they frequent. And it's primarily a winter survey, so you learn to identify tracks in the snow. Uh, you are assigned an area of 200 square miles, and you are to go out there with an all-terrain vehicle of some kind, a four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. Uh, you want to go on roads that are not paved. Um, you want to go where there isn't a lot of traffic from cars because you're not going to be able to see those tracks of carnivores. And to they, it takes you all day to do 30 miles because you're driving along and looking out the window and driving along and looking and then stopping and checking. And I remember the first year that we went, it was below zero. It was Christmas vacation. We were teaching. Uh, and we'd get out and check and it would be white-tailed deer. And we'd get back in the car. And because the snow is so deep, you can't really tell. You see the the pattern is very similar. They're, they're both animals that walk similarly, even though they're really very different if you had them in front of you. And there weren't any wolves anyway in our, pa in our assigned block because there just weren't any yet. So we found coyotes and we found white-tailed deer. And now where we are tracking, which is the same areas, there are six packs that we're keeping track of and we're also involved in the summer with howling surveys and Larry is very good at sounding like a wolf <laughs> and if you know where to do your howl they will answer you because howling is a way that wolves mark their territory and if you are a threat and he represents a threat he sounds like a wolf that's trespassing they will respond and so then you listen and you're hoping you'll hear pups as well as the adults, and then you record that. And so it's, it's very uh, interesting. How many of you have been, have been able to see in the wild a wolf? Only one hand, two. Was it in Wisconsin? Yes. That, 
that is truly wonderful, isn't it? How many have heard a wolf howl? people three yeah so that so those are wonderful things that we can say that we have in Wisconsin now and we didn't there was a while there where we had zero wolves they were pretty much extirpated down to zero in the 1950s and they returned and that's what we're going to talk about today's total of wolves is probably around 650 now actually counting wolves is a little ridiculous isn't it mm -hmm. um, they're hard to see in Wisconsin, so we do the best we can, do surveys in the winter, they have pups, that changes the number, some of the pups die, some of the adults die, so the number is changing constantly, and that number of uh, 650 is minimum, because we're very, we're not exaggerating, we're trying to be honest about it. And I, just to show you, if I had a wolf today that was visiting here, First of all, he was standing here next to me. His um, back would come to my waist. Wow. They have very long legs. And when you see them in the wild, that's the first thing you, you notice, that their legs are so out of proportion. They seem like they're on stilts. They have these long legs. And if I had a coyote here, which we have probably 25,000 in the state of Wisconsin, that would come to my knees. So a big difference in size. And coyotes are very common, wolves not so common. And we're gonna look at the um, different things that I have, the pelts and the, the skull and so forth after the program. But this is, a, this is a wolf pelt and you can see he's pretty big. Now this is a wolf that was preying on livestock and was euthanized. So he is not prime <laughs> he was killed in the summer, he doesn't have a winter coat, and he probably isn't an adult, it's probably a yearling, but he's still very big. <laughs> and this is one of our Rock County coyotes, and he's about to hear. So there is quite a difference in the size. Okay, let's start our program. <laughs> Wolves have truly recovered. We have gone from zero to 650 uh, in not very many years. Next. The fossil record of wolves goes back a long way, um, probably um, so long before the Ice Age. We had wolves, we know about dire wolves that left many fossil records in the La Brea tar pits in California, and they are different from the wolf that we have today, the Canis lupus. It was Canis diarus. So they're, they're, they are in the Canis family, um, and they were very large wolves. They, some of them weighed almost 200 pounds. They had short legs compared to our wolves, and they seemed to be adapted to a fairly warm climate. Our wolf, Canis lupus, Canis lupus is basically the wolf that is in North America and Europe and Asia. It is, um, and I was reading in a book that it was talking about how the, the wolf as a mammal next to man is the most widely distributed mammal. It is, it is able to live in such a variety of habitats. We have living today um, another Canis animal, which is Canis rufus, which is the red wolf. The red wolf, <coughs> the story goes that Canis lupus was um, the main wolf in North America. But then when the Bering Strait um, emerged so that the animals could travel from North America to Eurasia, many of them did and they really evolved um, to what we know today in Eurasia. Then they came back across the Bering Strait and they were trapped because of the ice and uh, they lived in the northern parts of North America and they are what is called a whole Arctic animal, an animal that is only living north of the equator. There were wolf-like animals in South America but they weren't Canis lupus. The red wolf 
never left North America. And it um, today is, is struggling along. I think there's about 200 red wolves, and they are very closely monitored, and they're pretty much confined to South Carolina. But when they decided that they were really endangered, there were some in Texas and Louisiana, which they trapped and um, kept in cages and, uh, and artificially had them breed until they could be reintroduced back into um, the wild. So the wolf that we have today in Wisconsin and Minnesota and Michigan is Canis lupus. And the only other one that you hear about is this one, the Mexican wolf, and he's a Canis lupus, but he's got another name because he's a subspecies. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the wolves adapt to the environment and the prey that they feed on, and so if they live in a southern area where it's um, warm, um, they're usually smaller, their prey animals are smaller, and the northern more um, individuals look different only because they're feeding on larger prey and it's cold and they have a bigger body. <coughs> okay, next. This is the red wolf. And they are um, smaller, they're actually very close to the size of the wolf that we have in Wisconsin. They tend to weigh around 60 to 80 pounds, something like that. Next. And this is the Mexican wolf, and it's much smaller. Next. And this is uh, the first wolf in Wisconsin that we saw. And this is a uh, Black River Falls wolf. He's really beautiful. It's probably um, a young one. And we are in a vehicle, so it's like a blind. He doesn't realize there's human beings. You, if you jump out of a car and take pictures, then they're gone. Next. And this is a uh, graph of how the population of wolves have changed since they uh, really were obvious to back in Wisconsin. In 1980, we probably had 25 wolves and five packs, um, realizing that we had zero in the 1950s. And then today, we're still doing really well. The population is still really growing. Um, 14% increase in um, population in the last year. We have 162 packs. Next. This is the coyote. And this is in the same, it's a dog, but it's um, much smaller and very common. Um, we probably have them living in Janesville. <coughs> Next. The wolf adapts to where it lives. And they're all Canis lupus, but they look different. This is, we have black wolves in Wisconsin, but where they are more common is in Canada, in the forested areas where it's dark, and, it, and they can camouflage by being black. Actually, they don't camouflage as well, particularly in Yellowstone. You can see the black wolf plainly out in the grasslands. But where they probably evolved, they are black. And it's still Canis lupus. Next. The Arctic wolf is what we saw when we went to um, up into the Northwest Territory are large animals. It, it works out that at the surface area compared to the body mass, the bigger the animal, the better able they are able to survive the extreme temperatures. And in the areas, the Northwest Territories, there may be days and days, maybe months, where, like Ellesmere Island even, they have no daylight all winter long, and these wolves live there. And they've adapted to that. So the white, we thought, boy, we're going to be able to see these guys uh, in the summer really easily in the tundra, and you can't, because they are just, they curl up in the, amongst the rocks, and they look like a rock. You mm -hmm. cannot see them. But they're still Canis lupus, same species, still called the gray wolf, even though it's white. Mm -hmm. Next. They're carnivores, and they are well adapted. We're going to talk a lot more about this after this program, where I can show you the skull. But these teeth right here are different than humans. These are carnassial teeth. Dogs have carnassial teeth. Dogs probably evolved from wolves maybe 15 to 30,000 years ago. So genetically, they're very, 
very similar. And this, how dogs evolved from wolves is still something where people are discussing. Did, did, uh, did the dog, was that a wolf that was not afraid of people and liked to freeload off of food at, at camps? Um, and that the what is evolved into wolves is afraid of people, and we don't know. But whatever. Um, they both have carnassial teeth, which are used for crushing bone, which you would need to do if you're going to feed on animals like deer. And these are the canines, of course, which they use to grab their prey. Next. All wolves, no matter where they live, in the Arctic, in Mexico, wherever they live, they feed on an animal that is an ungulate, an animal that has usually hooves, and in the state of Wisconsin, it's the white-tailed deer. That's their primary diet. They have to have that to survive. However, there are wolves in Spain and Italy that live on garbage, so they're not going to pass it up. But their primary prey, of course, is a hoofed animal. Mm -hmm. When a wolf chases a deer, a deer can run faster than a wolf. The deer is made for speed. They have hooves. They're actually standing on their toes, and they can really go quickly. So in the summertime, wolves are not eating deer unless there's something wrong with the deer, except for fawns. During the season, the, when the fawns are first born in the first couple months, then a fawn isn't such a challenge to catch. So they would eat deer in that form. But in the end of the summer, August, September, October, their primary food are beaver, because that's a lot easier to catch. And there's a lot of food in 40 pounds of beaver. Mm -hmm. And then these are like Doritos. <laughs> this is when you're hard up and you're, it's a snack. But uh, that's not their main food. Next. Uh, this is a um, booklet that was just put out by the DNR. And it is interesting because it compares uh, what happens to deer with, with different things. So here is our hunters. This is Wisconsin. This is just 2009. 122,000 deer. And then. How many deer die because the winter is stressful? There's not enough food. There's some heavy snow cover. How many are killed by bear? These are mostly fawns. How many are killed by coyotes? Again, mostly fawns. How many are killed by wolves, considering we have 650 wolves, and a wolf can eat 18 or to 20 uh, deer in a year? How many are hit by cars? And then. Bobcats are a factor also. So that's interesting. People, one of the complaints people have is that we need to not have so many wolves because they eat a significant amount of deer. And they really don't. Um, even in the best conditions, it's, we have a huge deer population. Next. When wolves kill deer, they eat everything. And one of the ways when we look for scat or the poop from a uh, wolf, we always know they've been eating deer because you can see the bones, the teeth, mm -hmm. um, the hair. And so this is a wolf kill after they've finished. Of course, there's a lot of other scavengers that come in and finish it as well. Next. This is a saying that really describes some of the qualities that wolves have that are remarkable. An eagle can see a snowflake fall. A deer can hear a snowflake fall. A bear can smell a snowflake fall. A wolf can do all three. Their best sense is their sense of smell. And they are absolutely incredible. Um, it just makes them hard to trap. We'll talk about that. Next. Wolves live in packs. And this is a picture of a wolf pack in Wisconsin. And this is a very large one. Typically, our packs are four to six wolves. To be a pack, you only need the breeding pair, the male and female wolf. The rest of the pack are usually pups of the year and then the yearlings from the year before, the pups from the year before. Very seldom 
in Wisconsin, do we have packs that have wolves older than that yearling? If you go to Yellowstone, where humans are not a factor in how old a wolf can live, where they are, it is a factor here in Wisconsin, their packs have individuals that are easily seven, eight, and nine years old. And a wolf is not really fully mature until it's about five years old. They can reproduce at a much younger age. And in Wisconsin, a typical wolf is dead by five years old. So that's why our, our packs are fairly small. Next. Uh, one of the neat things that when we went to Yellowstone this summer, we had a class with Doug Smith, who is the man in charge of the wolf recovery program at Yellowstone National Park. And he, we were able to take slides from his program. So they're going to be in here. And that's why they're labeled with who's involved in the hunt. And what we found out is, in all cases, wolves hunt, use strategies of a pack to catch their prey, especially if the animal is an elk or a bison that's very, very large. Um, the leader of the pack, which we used to call the alpha males and female, we don't call them that anymore because it's based on studies that were made with, with packs that were confined and they don't act the same in the wild. Um, the breeding male and female usually don't take part in the hunt because there's a lot of injuries that occur in the hunt. And what they have are these wolves that are four and five years old that are in the pack and they're in their prime. And the breeding male and female may even be older, seven, eight, nine years old. And then you see a pup learning. Next. In uh, Yellowstone, this is another one of Doug Smith's um, slides. These are wolves pursuing uh, a prey animal in the water. Mm -hmm. And t when we actually saw out in Lamar Valley a um, wolf chasing an elk, and the elk, to get away from him, went into the water. There was a river that runs through the Lamar Valley. So they feel safer, but actually it's not. It's a delusion, because <laughs> they can swim quite well. Next. This is a, an, an alpha or a breeding male or female. They are not autocratic leaders. They're like mom and pop that run this, this dictatorship. And um, they eat first, even though they didn't maybe bring that animal down. Now, this is a deer, and a wolf doesn't need a pack to bring down a deer. Um, that only if they had bigger prey would they, if they took a moose or an elk, they would need a pack. They, the um, leaders always eat first, mm -hmm. and after they eat, if they have pups, they will go back to the place where the pups are, the rendezvous site or the den, and regurgitate the food and feed them that way. Next. And this is after <laughs> they take turns. One of the things that was very interesting to us was in Yellowstone this summer was watching, there were uh, several bison that died of natural causes. And then the carcass would be out there and we'd watch the animals come in. And it's a regular uh, chain of events. You have the wolves and then you have the grizzlies and you have coyotes and you have ravens and magpies. And then you have these lone wolves that have come in from other pack territories and they sort of sneak in with their tail between their legs and they're easily intimidated by um, any other, like even coyotes. If there's a couple of coyotes, they will chase the wolf away. So there's a regular pecking order on the, the carcass. And carcasses are very important for feeding a lot of animals. They've found out that the grizzly bears, for example, come out of hibernation earlier and they don't go into hibernation until later because there's so much food available thanks to the wolves. Next. This is a picture of the leader of the, the pack. These are, they are usually the largest animals. They're not chosen by their intelligence or their personality. It's their might, so to speak. So these, and they are unrelated. They are never related. Everybody else in the pack is their offspring, but they are not related. Next. 
The pups are born usually in April uh, in the state of Wisconsin, and they are so helpless when they are first born. In fact, for the first three weeks, they don't see, they don't hear. Um, they are absolutely dependent on their um, mother to take care of them, and she is dependent on the other, the father, or the rest of the pack to bring her food, because she will, they need her for warmth and for food. Next. After about six to eight weeks, the animals, the wolves, are taken to a rendezvous site. Now, this is rendezvous site is in uh, Northwest Territories because that's what we, one of our uh, projects in that workshop was to watch the rendezvous site. <coughs> a rendezvous site is like a nursery, <coughs> and that's where the pups will spend the summer. And they will be guarded. There will always be an adult with them. Um, at all times, and they will really defend this. Now, what's happened in Wisconsin is that where we track, they um, they hunt, they practice um, tracking bear and coyote with dogs, and they bait the bears. And putting the bait out is attractive to wolves, and it's not healthy for them. It's junk food, but they think it's great. And what happens is they make their rendezvous site where the baiting, they're baiting the bears. And then the hunters come in with their dogs, and the dogs are trespassing right in a place that they are, the wolves are very protective of their rendezvous site. And so that's where we're having injuries and death due to hunting dogs. The uh, main place is the rendezvous site. This is also the place where we want to find the wolf pack. We want to go at night and howl near the rendezvous site. And then we will, that they won't answer us often, even though we're finding that they've walked these roads over here because they don't protect that area like they do where the pups are. So it's a very important place for the pups to grow up. Okay, next. To mark their territory, Wolves have several techniques, and it's very important. They, that's the way wolves work. They have an area that is their pack's area to hunt, and they protect it. And in the long run, it should protect them from having a lot of, of interchange with other wolves because they respect the boundaries. And to mark their boundaries, they use various um, scent means, like this is on what we call an RLU, which is raised leg urination, and he's urinating on this tree. And he is, by raising his leg, the urine is squirt right to a level which would be right at nose level for another wolf trotting along. And these are always pathways. When we go down the road and we're seeing RLUs, they're going to be every two-tenths of a mile. And we just, we just start seeing, looking for that yellow snow. Whoop, there it is. <laughs> and it's usually a tuft of grass or a rock or it's a, here it's a tree. The male and the female, the alpha male and female, both do RLUs as a way to mark territory. And if there are two packs that have a, they butt together, boy, there's a lot of RLUs. <laughs> and they, after they do the RLU, they scratch the ground, and you've probably seen dogs do that. And that's, again, they have um, hormone chemicals in their, between their toes that leave scents in the um, snow to mark that this belongs to this pack. Next. This is um, very exciting. When Larry and I find this kind of yellow snow, this is a double RLU, and this tells us that our pack is breeding. This is the female. There's really a big difference. The male, he does like Picasso, and the urine goes <laughs> The female is like that. And she has blood in it, which means she's an estrus, which means she's going to be breeding soon, and that they are a, they're probably bonded together. Um, they're going to have pups in the spring, and that's very exciting for her to, to project what's going to happen to the pack. Next. This is a summer shot. This is scat poop. Um, 
this has butterflies on it, and that's how we find them. We drive down these logging roads, and the butterflies flutter up, and then, oh, there's a nice um, wolf scat. And you know it's wolf scat by the size and by the fact that you can see all this hair in it, which is from rabbit or, or snowshoe hair or deer. Next. They also mark their territory by howling. And they're very vocal. They um, really like to howl. Um, when we are in places where we can really watch living wolves doing their thing, like the Lamar Valley and Yellowstone or the Northwest Territory, you can they howl a lot. They they uh, make sounds like dogs. They they bark. They um, but howling basically the main thing probably for howling is to mark your territory and. They certainly respond when Larry howls. Next. This is a map of the wolves in Wisconsin. And probably the one idea that I, I keep finding people have that misconception about is that the wolves in Wisconsin didn't, they were not introduced. We have introduced elk. Pine marten, other animals, but we did not introduce wolves. They come from Minnesota. When, when the wolves were extirpated from the lower 48, and basically they were, there were, they, I'm amazed in the National Park program to see them extirpating wolves in Yellowstone and every, everywhere where there were people, they got rid of the wolves. But they did not successfully get rid of wolves in northern Minnesota. There were about 700 wolves. <coughs> we had zero, and every other state except Alaska had zero. So all these wolf packs, we didn't bring anybody here. There are wolves that have come from Minnesota. And where did Minnesota get them? They come from Canada. So we have black wolves. We don't have Arctic wolves, but we have black wolves and gray wolves in Wisconsin. And this is what it looks like right now, 162 packs. They have pretty much settled down in the prime real estate in the state for wolves. From now on, they are going to try to set up their pack territories in places that are less desirable to us. They, one of the main um, criteria for a good place for wolves is not a lot of roads and cars because they just don't look both ways. They are killed very easily by vehicles, and so um, that's the main thing. But we also don't want them near livestock. So when, they, so when our wolf management plan, we've divided the state into zones that are desirable. This is a desirable state um, zone in this one. But these are agricultural. And so any wolves that are settling in there and are in any problem taking livestock or being bold, coming in people's yards, they will probably be removed. Can't be removed now, though, can they? Because it's endangered. We keep um, going back and forth between being endangered, protected, threatened. So right now we're endangered, and there's nothing that can be done with a wolf that's a problem. Next. This is, um, I wanted you to see this. This is interesting. Um, in Wisconsin, about 80% of the ways that wolves die is humans, human-related. So we have wol wolves are killed by illegal killing. That's the Almost half the wolves die illegally. People shoot them, snare them, trap them. A bunch of them are, are hit by cars because they don't look. And then we have one by train. <laughs> and then these are the other two causes, disease and wolves. Now, if I had a chart of Yellowstone's wolves mortality, there would be no illegal killings, no cars, no trains. Well, that might be one car. I think there was one killed in Yellowstone last year. But basically, the number one cause of death to wolves, if man is removed from the equation, is other wolves. And they don't tolerate other wolves. 
That's why we're having trouble with dogs, hunting dogs. They just they, they don't see the difference. Next. This is a wolf death. This is a wolf pack killing another wolf. And if you have done anything with following the wolves and let's say in Yellowstone, it's just like a soap opera. They and packs are so successful and they're huge and they've got the prime real estate. And then the next year they're gone, they're wiped out, and it's just amazing. So it's, they have wars, and, and um, it's a dynamic system. It's, it's uh, um, really something. Next, this is, we are fortunate where we track wolves, it's sandy and there's a, it's very easy to see tracks. We have to learn the difference between a wolf and a dog and a coyote and a fox. They're all canids and they, they look similar. The wolf is um, very disciplined. The, the feet are very oblong and very nicely formed. And their size is typically three and a half inches wide or so and four inches or so long. They also walk very, the feet are almost in a line with each other. Next, this is one in the mud. They always, these toes are very prominent. But they have, teach, they have given us forms to use where we actually, if it's a dog, we can actually figure out what breed of dog it is. We have, Larry and I have never done that. We just say, if it's a wolf, that's good, but we don't care what kind of dog it is. But you can see it's a large animal. Next. This is one of the neatest, most exciting um, pictures that we ever found, or seen that we came upon where we were doing this in the winter. This is a wolf pack. <coughs> this is the Eau Claire River pack. Um, and they're walking in a line. This is what I was telling you. That dogs don't do this. We, we have bred dogs. We breed dogs to make their chest uh, big and attractive. Now, there are some breeds like the Border Collie and the Greyhound that do have very narrow chests. But wolves are like those. They're very narrow chest, and they can walk directly in line. So the, the feet, there's no width here. There's no straddle. And they step on each other's footprints because the snow is deep and it's easier. So when our job as trackers then is to follow along and see where they veer off, and then they'll split up, and we can figure out how many are in this pack. So next, this is from Yellowstone. This is a wolf that is lame, probably from an injury from trying to bring down an elk or something. And there is a straddle. See, there's a big space, and he's dragging his feet. A lot of mortality in wolves in Yellowstone due to prey animals, kicking them. Next. How do we um, monitor them besides that? This is, um, this is a Yellowstone. This is Doug Smith. This is one of the most exciting things he does. He, in fact, when he was telling the story of how they do this, go up in a helicopter and shoot tranquilizers into the wolves, he was practically shouting. He was so excited. And his wife says that until they get all these wolves radio collared, he can't relax. And they do it at this time, well, into the winter more. Because, and in Yellowstone, they have um, a lot of open areas, and they go on a day when the snow is fairly deep and the wolf is encumbered by the snow, and then he has to hit, they shoot the um, tranquilizer. And I imagine it takes a lot of skill. Next, this is what we do in Wisconsin. We have leg hole traps. And this man holding this is as Ron Schultz, and he is they should write a book about him or do a documentary. He's a very interesting man. Um, he's worked with these leg hold traps so that the wolf uh, isn't hurt, but he's in enough discomfort that he doesn't try to get out of it because we don't want him chewing their foot off or something. This is what you have to do if you're a wolf. You have to step on that. And wolves are smart. They put this trap in the ground in a place where he's going to have to step right onto that, um, I don't know what this plate is called. 
And to do it, they use bait. They, he actually, Ron, makes bait that it's, a, it's the most disgusting stuff you've ever seen. It looks like, I, I think he does use lard as the base of it, and, but the, the secret ingredient is urine from a wolf. And wolves can't tolerate that. This other wolf smell, they, when they smell that urine, they, they, um, they know that isn't someone that they know. It isn't someone in their pack. And they, they investigate it, and that's how they step into it. So in Wisconsin, we don't shoot from the air to tranquilize them. Uh, we use a trap. Next. And here's a wolf in a trap. And um, they do this in the end of the summer, about uh, August, September. Um, so he's got a summer coat. He looks kind of thin. And they are very, when they set these traps, it's a, they um, mark it off so people know not to come in there with their hunting dogs. Uh, and they check the traps many times in a day to make sure that the, there is not a wolf in it. Uh, and then, once they find the wolf in the trap, they go up to the wolf and they have a, a stick with a syringe and they inject a tranquilizer and then they put a collar on him. Oh, I'm trying to change the picture. <laughs> this is a radio collar. And when I was a teacher at Marshall, we, um, the, the kids earned money to, to buy one. They cost about $300, $400 probably now, uh, where you can name the wolf that they put the collar on, and it will give off a radio way, uh, frequency um, so that they can receive that radio message and find the wolf. They, these collars are, are good for about two years um, if the wolf lives that long, and that was one of the hardest things about um, my experience as a teacher and the, and the students. They would buy the collar and we'd find out about it and it would be a neat wolf and then it'd be dead six weeks later. And then it happened over and over again. But this is, we have about 15% um, of our 162 packs have a radio collared wolf in them. And they're very important for us to, f to find the wolf packs in the winter and to, um, to study their, mo their motion where they go. Next. Here they are putting the collar on, and it's it's a really um, it's not easy to do. The wolf gets overheated. Um, we had a wolf that in our area that we we're tracking that got the opposite problem, got cold because after it was released from getting the collar on, it fell into the water that was melted ice, and it wasn't really awake, and then they took it in the car, they kept it warm, and it was okay. But it's not easy because while they're tranquilized, they don't control their temperature very well. There are also collars that are uh, work on a satellite's um, message, and they, they're very much more expensive. David Meech has been sponsoring the, the cost of some in Wisconsin. They are more like $3,000 than $300. Um, and they are really incredible because the, the animal can leave the state, can go a long distance, that, uh, and you can track it. And it keeps a record. They can, you can actually um, communicate with that collar and download the, the locations that that wolf's been in for several weeks. So it's uh, very interesting for research. Next. Are wolves dangerous? Well, this is always one of the um, people bring up is this is this going to be dangerous to have wolves in our neighborhood? Well, to to look at the opposite side, well, what is dangerous to people? What are killing people? And these are from the United States. These are venomous animals that have caused death to humans. Twelve people died have died from this is in a year. Bees. 10 from wasps, 14 from snakes, 6 from spiders, 1 from a scorpion. Dogs, on the average, cause 20 deaths per year. And you see bison, moose, bear, sharks. From 1670 to 2003, 52 deaths. 
Have wolves caused death? Well, I would guess so, probably. Um, but that isn't something you should be worrying about. Certainly, um, when we have wolves near where people live, then there you have to treat them like what they are. But they are a predator, and they are capable of injuring people. And people have been. We just had a recent uh, article in the paper about a coyote that killed a 19-year-old woman who was running, and that's not much different than a wolf. That um, under certain circumstances where the wolf is not afraid of you and you're running, um, that could have that could be um, a situation that could be bad. Next. So here's a habituated wolf. This is in Yellowstone. And this is the first year since they were introduced in 1995 that they had to euthanize a wolf that was bold. And this wolf, like the coyote that we just were talking about, was chasing people on a bike or on a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And that's it's this predator-prey situation. And we were just discussing this at home that our, um, we have chickens. And if the chicken, and they get out of the, the corral, and if they are just walking along and the dog is stalking them, as long as the chicken doesn't run, they're fine. And they, they, they just walk over and go back in the corral, then they are fine. But if they get all in a panic and run, then that sets up that predator-prey feeling, and then I have a dead chicken. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, so it will be interesting to watch, but I think that in situations where um, predators kill people or uh, dogs, and so I think that the animal is running away. And we know that in elks and um, bison in Yellowstone, if they don't run and they turn and face the wolf pack, they usually survive. It's the running that gets the whole thing going. But anyway, this is a bold wolf, and this would be a problem. We need to be able to control wolves that are bold and they're where people are. Next. We have problems with attitudes. UP is a, I don't think it's any different than in, in Wisconsin either. Next. What's going to happen to the wolf in Wisconsin? Well, that is a question we really don't have an answer to. The population has surpassed um, the social carrying capacity. You know that we learn in ecology that there is the carrying capacity of a habitat, you know, what's available for them, and food and so forth, and space. Um, but our cutoff in the wolf is a smaller number than what we could actually feed with the deer population and the space that we have in the state of Wisconsin. We have a problem with livestock, and we have a problem with um, people. And so um, we already are past that number. We had a, the agreement had been with various interest groups that um, the number should be like 350 to 500. And now we're at 650. And so what, what are we going to do about that? Um, litigations keep the wolf classified as an endangered species. And the last lawsuit, uh, or whatever it is, um, was by the Humane Society of America. And they believe that the wolf has not been restored to 95% of the former um, <coughs> places that it lived. And so we're at 5%. And it looks like, uh, so after it's declassified, maybe we go back, or delisted, and we go back to being threatened or protected, there'll only be more litigation. So I don't, I don't know um, where we're going to, if we're ever going to solve that problem. Wolves will move to less desirable places where there are more people. They are opportunistic. They are like the coyote. They will be able to live. They don't need uh, a forest. They just need. Uh, <coughs> deer and they need and so they'll and like the, the wolves in Italy they can live on garbage they, they will adapt to places where we don't really want them so that's what I meant by desirable 
the less desirable. Next. This is um, one of the things that's interesting about wolves. This is how they spread out and form new territories. And so these are actual um, paths of dispersing wolves. When wolves are about um, a year to two years old, they frequently leave the territory. This is in Wisconsin, where our packs don't ever get that old, um, and try to find a mate and to find a new territory. And some have gone tremendous distances. We had one that there was a pup that got a, uh, had an ear tag put on it in Black River Falls, and it ended up dying 12 miles from the border of Indiana here, right outside of Ohio. So it traveled all this way and was hit by a car. So this is, they travel a tremendous distance. The one that was in the news in the spring uh, was in the west and it traveled, it had a satellite collar, they know it went a thousand miles. And um, so that they're capable of going great distances. And that's one thing um, why we sometimes see wolves down here in Janesville and Beloit that they, um, they're passing through. They aren't living here. Maybe someday they will, <laughs> but um, that's why we, they turn up alongside the road in Jefferson or whatever. Next. This is not a very good um, slide. Um, David Ladinoff um, has made, um, these are computer projections of where we predict wolves are going to be, what kind of habitat they're going to live. And the red, of course, is where we would expect them to be the most, that's the most desirable habitat. And what's interesting is he does have some areas right along the Mississippi here that he predicts that Wisconsin will have. They, um, they think that between Michigan and Wisconsin, we should have about 1,700 wolves. That would be, uh, that's probably what we could tolerate. So it'll be, it'll be, Interesting to see what does happen. Next, are they worth it? Cons, they cause depredation on livestock and hunting dogs, and I'm gonna talk about all these in the next slides, and they eat deer. Pros, they seem to affect life in all levels of the food chain, which is called a trophic cascade, and they are historically a part of the ecosystem in Wisconsin. Next. This is one of the dogs we've come across when we are tracking. And this is amazing um, how much we uh, in our state um, compensate loss of dogs to, including hunting dogs, to wolves. And it's a big part of the expense. The last year we spent, I think it was over $100,000 compensating all livestock, cows, horses, llamas, everything that had been killed by wolves or injured, and 48,000 of it was dogs. And it's, it's um, why do we do that? It's basically to help the attitude of the people that are living with wolves tolerate them because you, you don't feel quite so angry about it. It's still a loss. But that's one of the problems with wolves. They kill dogs. Dogs to them are just like a trespassing wolf, in their, and especially in their rendezvous sites, which we talked about is where they're baiting bears. Next. Wolves are important. This is a deer, um, the rib cage, and it has a downy woodpecker on it and some chickadees. <laughs> so the kill of some deer are um, a source of food for lots of animals. And they are certainly, they help, they're, they have an effect on lots of living things. Just, it's just really amazing. It isn't just that they affect what they eat, they also affect other animals that feed on the same thing that they've, they've left. Um, and they actually affect even the plants that live, that are feeding the deer. And we'll, I'll show that in the next slide. 
we have um, a lot of vegetation that is affected by the grazing animals. The studies that have been made in Yellowstone are slightly different than the studies that are in Wisconsin. And in Yellowstone, they have a lot more documentation for the effect of wolves on all the animals' life, including the plants, in the food webs. But certainly, there's a lot of vegetation because we have such a huge number of deer, and the deer um, feed on those things that th those plants don't grow as well um, as they would if we had lesser numbers of deer. And so once the, um, the deer are not able to hang out in places where um, wolves can get after, after them, then um, that area begins to restore. The plants restore, and then you have other things coming in that um, other animals that live in that same, on those plants, because they, the plants are growing. The only thing that I've actually seen in Wisconsin uh, really affected by deer are places where there's deer yards, and they have eaten off the trees, so the trees are all as tall as your knees, uh, and they never get in, and they're old trees, they're very old trees, but they look like little tiny saplings because the deer keep eating them away. But in um, Yellowstone, they have other examples that are much more obvious than what we have. Maybe as time goes on, we'll see the tropic cascade in uh, Wisconsin. Next. And here's a, um, a songbird, not necessarily coming in because the deer have been reduced by the wolves. Next. The wolf is neither man's competitor nor his enemy. He is a fellow creature with whom the earth must be shared. And that is an idea that is pretty uh, profound. Um, you meet people that think wolves are like gods, that they are, sh they are so perfect an animal that we should do everything to save them and never kill any. Um, and David Meech is more saying uh, wolves are, are another animal and the only part of this whole system of living things, that we need them because they are important in the ecosystem. Next. <clears throat> this is a wolf pack of Wisconsin, and it's nice and small. They're able to find it because they're up in a plane and they have radio collar on one of the wolves, and so that's how the plane goes in. And we have pilots that go out during the winter, particularly when the trees are bare, and look for our wolf packs. Okay, that should be the last slide, I think. Now, we're going to show you some things. How am I doing? It's 3 o'clock. we got to have Larry Howell. <laughs> <laughs> um, Did you want to go through anything else? Here? I don't want to keep them more than I took. Uh, um, the um, okay, go a little. little I, I will just show some things really quickly, and then he'll do his howling. Um, first, we're going to play for you the coyote. And this, the coyote, I always take these, this is my first um, pelt that I took for programs because I can show the features of the um, pelt of a wolf with the coyote. And this, of course, is trapped in Wisconsin and it's in the winter and it's got undercoat. Wolves are really Arctic animals. They, they don't care how cold it is. If they're healthy, our wolves, some of them have mange and they lose their hair and that's not so good. But um, if you are a healthy wolf, you have a coat like a healthy coyote. You have an undercoat that's very warm, and then you have this exterior, this outer coat that is waterproof. And they actually, not only is it waterproof, but there's, I don't know if you can see, there's kind of like capes or layering effect on the, on the neck. And that allows the, the rain to just wash right off them. And then they have this tail. When they curl up, they can put that over their face. And they can tolerate really all we can give them. I mean, they go to Ellesmere Island and they don't have a problem. They survive. So um, the pelt is, a, is really wonderful. Mm -hmm. 
This is the um, skull that I have. This was a birthday present from my husband. This is a, this is not a, this is a, a replica. It's not the real thing. But um, you can see the, um, the teeth. They have um, the front teeth, which they use for uh, cleaning their fur and, and cleaning the, the food off, the meat and stuff off the hide, canines and then molars, and these are the carnassial teeth that we talked about earlier that are, they shear like a scissors, and so they can crush bone with those teeth. I have some scat, and boy, it, it took a lot of ingenuity to get this in a place where I could pass this around and go around. <laughs> so I dried it and so forth, but you can see in here this is probably a fawn, the teeth and the hooves and the hair um, that they've been, this is what they couldn't digest. So they've digested all the rest. And um, these will be up here when you, at the end. This is a footprint of a wolf from Yellowstone. Yellowstone's wolves were introduced, they were brought from Canada. They're large animals. They're bigger than the animals in Wisconsin. The foot is really huge. This is a footprint from one of our wolf packs that we um, look at. And you would have to think that that was a dog or a wolf because, in fact, we have dog breeds that are as large as a wolf. But the shape is very um, oval. And if it's a dog, it's more of a splayed. It's really not hard once you look and you see them in the snow. So this is a wolf footprint. Okay, we're going to start with a coyote and I'll let Larry talk. Okay, the, the first one I'll play is a coyote and um, I would assume that most of you have heard a coyote before and we live out in the country and, and for the last week, especially with the full moon, we've been hearing coyotes almost every night. So once you've he heard a coyote, you, you'll never mistake it for a wolf because it's very distinctive. It sounds a lot like a dog. So it's very high pitched, uh, very distinctive. And this is a recording of two wolves. And this was done in one of our territories. This is an Iron Run pack. And it was done late at night. Uh, and normally we, especially in the summertime, we do, we do our, our survey, howling surveys in June and, and maybe into July. And so what we're trying to do is, is be able to determine how many wolves are in a pack. And, by, by getting the, the pups involved. This was done with just the, what would be the alpha male or female or the dominant pair of wolves. And um, uh, it's very distinctive. It's a really good recording. The actual recording was taken with a handheld recorder. It wasn't very good, but I found somebody at the UW Whitewater who used to do uh, the sound systems for rock groups. And he was able to, to, to to in, uh, increase the volume and greatly decrease the static. There is static on it, but he did an amazing thing with this recording when you hear it. And it's really, it's really very neat. Thank you. 
quite, quite interesting. So what I do is, so when you start, when you haul, you start at a very low volume, first of all, and you face the four different directions. And if you don't get a response, then you haul again in four directions, and then you wait. And if nothing happens, then you get in your car and you go down the road, maybe another mile, and you do this, and you try to cover as much. And what, when we have all these packs, we may be out for hours late at night doing this. Uh, we've had some very interesting experiences. One experience was uh, where I was howling and nothing happened, but every time I'd howl, there would be all this activity in the underbrush that was right next to the road, so I didn't know what was going on. But eventually, after about four or five times of howling, this puppy started, and then the belts uh, chimed in, and so the whole pack was howling. And this was a little ways away from where our campground was. And next morning, we went back to this place on a logging road where we were howling, and there was all these wolf tracks all over. So they, after we had left, they had come and checked out the area that we were howling. And then, right in the middle of all the wolf tracks were bear tracks. So we had not only had attracted the wolves, but also a bear had come and, and checked it out. Uh, when I howl, I mean, I've had coyotes answer, I've had barred owls answer, uh, I've had dogs answer, so dogs in, in the immediate area, so you, sometimes you, you, you don't get what you would like in terms of a wolf. Um, we've also had an experience where I've howled and had puppies respond, and then you'll hear a bark from a, an adult, and then there's complete silence. It's just like, shut up. <laughs> and then there won't be any other response, and, and that's it for the night. So I'll, I'll give you an example of a howl. You don't have to be really that good at it, but it's just the idea that there's something in their territory that sounds like a wolf, and that will elicit a response. Mm -hmm. time for questions and answers and all that. But you also have your, don't forget your But I do have things, I have, this is a, from um, this year's Wolf Awareness Week, and you're welcome to help yourself. They, um, the Timberwolf Alliance chooses, the artists submit their pictures and we choose, and then the back has a lot of information on it about wolves. Well, this is, this is not a photograph, this is a painting. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Very interesting. Yeah. So, and then there's some other things if you're interested. Um, there's some, these are not recent though. This is 2007, All Wolves of Wisconsin. And then there's, and then I have a stuff from Timberwolf Alliance if you're interested. And I'm here for any questions, and so is Larry. So. <laughs> Can you just real quickly talk about the map? Sure. Each of these little wolves is a pack. And what you can see immediately is that most of the wolves are up here. And they go on into the UP. Um, and then there's a group that's very successful in central Wisconsin. And that's where we track, because that's the closest from Whitewater. And they're doing really well. They have basically filled it. I mean, it is just. Um, we're now moving out into agricultural areas because they are competing. There is no more space. And then there's little red dots, and these are observations of wolves. And I, I haven't put the most recent ones on there, um, but we found wolf scat in our back field about a month ago. So and it is wolf. There is no question about it. It, you would think it's a dog if, it, if there were feral dogs. They would look like a wolf if it was a big dog, but I, I doubt it. <laughs> so um, that's the story of this, and it's kind of interesting. We have an observation of wolf in Door County. These are, um, there was a wolf that was in the southern uh, unit of the Kettle Moraine, and we, that was documented. That was actually seen and then I think it died down in Illinois, hit by a car. 
Yep. What uh, status would you prefer to see the wolf under? Danger, threatened, off the list? Well, when I first was involved in this, I would like him really protected. But now that I understand the problem with them, they need to be they need to be managed, and they need to probably be protected or even classified as a fur bearer because you, you really can't manage wolves with your hands tied like that. And, and they the endangered status prevents any. Yeah. Even probably yeah. ones can't be taken, and, and sometimes they, they have to be. They found that with f ranchers and farmers, that if they have the, they know that they could do something if they had a wolf preying on their livestock, that that just really helped a lot. Then they would be much more open to trying to manage them. And it just helps your attitude. You feel like you, you're, it's illegal for you to do anything. So would and you have a limited hunting season? Something like that, yes. And what they've done in, in the West is they've picked areas where there's problems and they want wolves removed. And that's the idea that they do here. If, if there's wolves in an agricultural area, zone one or two or something, and they're in the wrong place, then, um, then that, would, that would be a place where they have a higher quota. Um, it's, I was just was reading about the wolves that were almost a whole pack was wiped out during the hunting season in Wyoming that had left Yellowstone and they had collars on them and, and they asked the hunters not to shoot collared wolves. But uh, so well, the greatest it, fear is is the more wolves we have, the greater the chance will be for you know an interaction between people and wolves and something's going to happen that could be disastrous to the reputation of the wolf, so they, they need to be managed somehow. Um, There's certainly been lessons learned from Boulder, Colorado, and the Cougar. If you, if you read the book, The Beast in the Garden, it, it, it has some ideas that you could extrapolate to wolves, that, that here is a carnivore <coughs> coming to feed on deer because people have planted all this lush vegetation for them. We have the same problem in, with, with wolves and, and they become bold and they begin to prey on their opportunists. So here's a dog. Somebody's dog is tied on a rope in the backyard or something and, or in the confined area. And it's just, it's just got to be managed somehow. And you can't do it the way it is. Mm -hmm. Wasn't yeah. the endangered status removed in Minnesota or someplace? Well, see, Minnesota, when the Endangered Species Act came into being in 1973, they already had 700. They had more than, they already were past uh, what they had to restore. So they started out at threatened. So when they are delist, when they go backward because of a, a lawsuit, they go back to threatened. They don't go back to endangered, whereas we, we had essentially zero. We probably didn't have zero. We probably had like five wolves, but it was negligible. So that's why they have an advantage during this back and forth. So it's actually creating a problem. The, the, it, I, it, it is going to be a problem when we have them have a hunting season. A lot of people are going to really object to that. But uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> Um, is there, why is it that the coyote is doing so well <laughs> and the wolf is just numbers? Yeah, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well, they just have a different niche and they eat smaller things and they fit in better. They're, they haven't been such a threat to people and pets and they aren't able to kill cows, they kill calves, they, they, they certainly are having an impact. We have a hunting season, I think it's 12 months of the year. And so people that are protecting cattle or horses or whatever, they feel that they can manage it. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, well, we, I, I, that's a part of the problem. We can't manage wolves right now. I think one of the things that I noticed about coyotes is that uh, if a hunter should go out and accidentally kill the elk, the whole pack goes wild and they all agree. 
until they, you know, through the order they get, and, and then the alpha appears again. And that's why I don't, I really don't think that they can get rid of them with this hunting season. You know, there is a lesson to be learned from chipmunks on that. <laughs> and people, 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 people get upset and they want to get rid of their chipmunks and they'll trap them and they catch all these chipmunks, maybe 80. They have zero chipmunks and you've created a chipmunk vacuum in your property. And so the chipmunks that have been competing for space all around move into this empty space. And we were talking with Doug Smith about that in Alaska because we hear of Sarah Palin and their aerial hunting and and how they're going to take out 80% of the wolves in an area. He said, is that going to impact them? Well, in that area, yeah, for about three or four years, there won't be very many wolves, but they're going to move right in because on the outsides, there's lots of them. And so you take out the alpha, and you've taken out the leader, and now all these are looking, they're going to be all this competition. They're going to set up, new, and you might have several packs where you had one. And they control the territory. They mark it. And, and coyotes do much like wolves. It's not quite as a uh, tight pack, but they do. And that's, that's why you observe that, that they seem to be breeding more. Yeah, because the, the alpha male prevents other males from breeding. So, so there is a relation to chipmunks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've got a family or well, a pair of foxes, breeding foxes on our property on and off the last few years and we go through a period where they'll wipe out all the rabbits and, and mm -hmm. the chipmunks and, and there'll be pieces of fur all around their yeah. den out and back and now they've moved away and, and now we've seen what, just what you said, they've yeah. moved back in. And it's a balance that's dynamic. Well, what's really interesting is that uh, the number of foxes in Wisconsin were really declining until the wolf appeared, okay? The coyotes kill foxes, but wolves kill coyotes. So the wolves have been greatly decreasing the number of coyotes in, in many areas, and the foxes have returned, you know, and the numbers have been really down. But that was really um, noticeable in Yellowstone, where the fox had almost disappeared in Yellowstone until the reintroduction of the wolf. And now the fox has just come really back and the coyote population has really been decimated by the wolves. It's because the wolves really view the coyote as a competitor. It doesn't do that with the fox at all. Um, it's a good example of the, the importance of the ecology of the wolf. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.